guys, we're back. Uh, this time I've got another investor out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, been watching this guy on Facebook for quite some time. He's got a lot of shenanigans going on, but primarily I see, um, you know, a dominator in the Ohio market. Um, I think the other day you were uh, lightly flexing on 50 Airbnbs. And um, uh, anyhow, I'd like to welcome you guys, uh, Stephen Morris here. Um, let's dig in and kind of see what we can do about this yeah. tragic crap yeah. we're in right now. Yeah, the 50 Airbnbs are more of a headache now than a flex, right? Because right. I won't travel, but we still have like 650 long-term rentals. And, um, you know, today's kind of a weird day for that too, because we're basically the first of the month. This will be the first first of the month since this for this virus stuff. And I know a lot of people right. might not pay and we're just kind of trying, we were talking right before we went live. It's a, a little bit about our business right now is just getting enough short term revenue to see where the dust, du the dust settles and, and, and maybe pivot. <laughs> I mean, everyone's trying to learn right now on what's going on and what the new government restrictions are or aren't. So it's, it's, a, it's a goofy time right now. Yeah. No, it's, um, I mean, some people are saying that uh, we're going to bounce back pretty quickly, which is, you know, gets my uh, or keeps my hopes up. But then some people are saying it's the, the start of the end. And I'm like, man, don't be saying that crap. I don't need to be hearing all that negativity right now. But, even, if it, even if it is, lie to me, right? So I can at least. Uh, right. <laughs> the right yeah. The yeah. So you're in Ohio. You've been there your whole life, you were saying. Um, and briefly you mentioned that you had some background in, uh, mortgages or l lending or what was that again? Just finance. I got an MBA in finance from uh, Bowling Green State University. So I always call it the Harvard of the Midwest, but I had a lot of gotcha. fun there and did a lot of socializing and, and networking, um, going to the bars and stuff like that, but right. still sneak out of there with a the degree. And so a lot we were talking about sometimes with the consulting business that we run, a lot of people just turn to us for, uh, just even if it's understanding mortgages or, or, or the stock market or stuff like that, we have a little bit of a background. So a lot of our clients, you know, lean on, on us to, to, especially in these times where there's, it seems like every day there's a new, you know, either mortgage forgiveness or uh, incentives or loans that small businesses can apply for with this virus. So a lot, you know, just kind of read what else is there to do <laughs> right? Um, and stay up to date on this stuff. And, and like I said, try to make some short term capital in the meantime, just to stay afloat. So, right. Um, well, let's, uh, I like to see how, uh, like I said before, how or why people got into real estate, uh, how long have you been in it and what kind of made you choose real estate? Yeah, I actually just really did have a passion for like the study of money and finance. I've never really had a super passion for real estate, but real estate seems to be the pinnacle of money. And you always hear that stat that, you know, nine out of 10 millionaires or this or that were created or attribute their first million to real estate. So it was just a place for me to go where I thought I could make a difference. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that money can be a really bad thing if there's, you know, greedy people or whatever. But I believe that especially in Cleveland, Ohio, you don't need a ton for it to be super greedy, right? Because it's not South Beach or New York where rents 3,000, 5,000 bucks. So I just always wanted to kind of make some cash and try to make some changes in, a, in a, a city that I grew up in and stuff like that. Try to give back not only through real estate and making buildings and communities nicer, but if you make a couple bucks and you can donate it to other causes too, that's pretty cool. So um, came out of school with an MBA and I had some family that was doing some flipping and stuff like that. I just tried to get involved. I did some, as everyone does coming up, I did some super low level, ground level, learn the industry kind of stuff where I would lease out their rentals and make a couple hundred bucks. And I was like 24 at the time. And that felt like a lot of money getting a check for four or 500 bucks, helping them lease stuff, some stuff up. And then right. realizing, you know, you start getting older and getting more bills. That's not a lot of money. So I decided that maybe I tried to flip a house or two and that went all right too. And it just progressed from, uh, house flipping, the wholesaling to uh, multifamily apartments. And then the, very recently we got in the Airbnb and we're able to scale that up. It was going fantastic right before this happened. <laughs> right. Sometimes you can't predict everything. Um, so we're, we're switching now our Airbnbs. We had so many cancellations. We had the NCAA tournament that was going to be here. Uh, Cleveland obviously is notoriously cold during the winter. So, uh, we were just starting to warm up and get some bookings and stuff like that. And then this just hit out of the blue and 
uh, we were sitting in Puerto Rico in a mastermind with a bunch of the guys from around here. And there were a couple Airbnb, Airbnb guys in the room. And it was like over when they started to announce some of these travel restrictions and stuff. And um, it was like, there were a couple people in the room losing five to 10 grand in like an hour with just cancellation email, cancellation email. So we've been, uh, we've been pivoting off that obviously and trying to figure out if we can get traveling nurses in there or if we can uh, lock some students in for, you know, whatever, short-term leases, stuff like that. We just don't want to obviously give up the ship and, and just let it bleed out until um, this goes away. So we're just trying to figure out what the best next move is right now, uh, short-term. So that was kind of the journey. Um, I always tell people as you're going through the, helping people get lease, you know, leased up rentals. And then you realize how much a landlord can make. So you're like, why can't I be a landlord? So you buy a couple of units and you start leasing up your own stuff. And you see when I was, I had a, I had a real estate license for a while and I would get property for my buddies or my families to flip. And I would get, you know, a three, $4,000 commission check. And then they would sell the place and cash a check for like 40 grand. And I was like, well, I can do this. You know, it just kind of feels yeah. like, I'm not the dumbest guy in the room. So let me try this too. And uh, just naturally progressed up to some bigger and bigger stuff. And, you know, like I said, just continue to try to try to figure out what the next play is in this little, hopefully like what you said, it's just a short term bubble. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, nobody really knows. Not a single person in the world can say they know what's going to happen after this. Mm -hmm. There's too many, too many unknowns, more and more cities. Like as me, me and you are jumping on this call, Dallas is announcing what they're going to do uh, moving forward, whether they're going to, they're going to keep a lockdown and uh, they're actually talking about locking down a bunch of streets. So people would stop, stop walking on the trails. They can walk on the streets mm -hmm. and so they can do the social distancing. So it's just getting more and more freaking weird out there. And then Trump, you know, well, I was going to say the Trump, but the election coming up, like nobody freaking knows what's going to happen. No, that's what I was, uh, <clears throat> I just put up a, and you can just, like I said, I've been doing a lot of reading because no one knows, right? So all you got to do is try to stay as educated on it as possible and not predict shit. Right. But I posted something right before and that was Freddie. And like you said, there's, it's crazy. Like every hour there's something coming down in the real estate world or local governments that will affect real estate. It's tough to keep track of it, but uh, you know, those uh, government assisted loans, they're now implementing interest reserves that it's going to make it much harder to buy and much harder to refi these properties. So, I mean, if people can't buy then they can't value add now contractors stop working. It's kind of a, a little bit of a scary spot. So uh, when I posted that, what well, my actual point is I posted that and I wasn't trying to predict what it would mean. Mm -hmm. Naturally, I think a lot of people come on cause they're just sitting at home and they want, you know, something to do or they want something to read and they're giving all these, like you said, like thoughts on what it's going to mean. And I don't, you know, obviously don't reply rudely, but I want to say like, no one knows what this is going to mean. No one knows how long this is going to be implemented, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so I try to just stay educated and uh, cause that's very important, but I don't try to predict stuff like you said, because predicting the stock market or terms of how quickly this will rebound or how long certain cities are going to stay closed, almost impossible. There's some crazy stuff going on. I'm apply the hour. Uh, so just like I said, we're just trying to wholesale some stuff and, and make a couple bucks to basically neutralize our expenses for the next month or two and see where this all shakes down. Cause I know I'm not a genius, so I'd rather just stay busy and try to, you know, offset the bleed and right. that whatever's happening in the, you know, in two or three months when this, when this is much clearer, we'll try to like actually pivot and create a model around maybe a new short term opportunity or something like that. So. I right. think that's important, like what you said. I don't think everyone should get too caught up in the hype of predicting or trying to fix this in three days. It's not going to happen. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, unless you've already got, you know, seven, eight, nine figures in the bank, mm -hmm. everybody's bracing for what's coming, and they just – you just got to do your best to prepare. I mean, it could be over by June, and it's a sweet summer, and we all go back about our lives, but then there's other stories of is it round two is going to come in the fall. And we're going to be bent over again. It's going to be uh, nuts. I mean, freaking nuts. They get twice in a year, but. Um. Yeah, I don't want to cause panic, but I got a buddy that works for the government. He was saying that, um, one, he's pretty connected to the Mexico border because he's dealt with that the last like four or five years. And he said that they're, <laughs> they're going to get hit really bad because they're not prepping like we were prepping and all this other stuff. And then obviously he's 
temporarily some half the year located in DC working for the government. Mm -hmm. So over on that East coast where there's a lot of problems because right. the, most of those states are so dense. And he said, there's national guard of like Rhode Island and some of the smaller states going door to door, trying to find people fleeing New York and send them back to New York. Like it's, there's some weird stuff happening. Really? <laughs> yeah. So like I said, I don't want to induce panic, but also like uh, all these people that are like, you know, trying to figure out what the, the next move of the, the government or the industry is. Yeah. I'm not sure we know or, uh, cause we're, we're in pretty uncharted water. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, pretty ironic that they're closing the borders on us, but we've been trying to close the borders on them for so long. <laughs> yeah. And like my buddy said, he goes, it's going to get, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be ironic now. Right. Cause we were trying to build a wall and not let them in. So now they're not letting us in. He goes, they're going to get hit arguably as bad as any country has been hit in the world. Yeah. And then, then we'll probably try to close it right back on them. So. Right. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. That's where my buddy, uh, went down there as this was unfolding. He's like, I gotta get down there one more time. Just go down there, chill on the beach, you know, get, you know, clear my head. And they made it up the day before they closed. Uh, the U S closed this, their side from letting people in. But, um, he was taking pictures of all the stores before we started our panic. They were already panicking down there, clearing stores out. And then there, they were already having civil unrest. And they were, um, once they went into lockdown, they were busting through store doors at, at night and it was already going nuts. We're in Puerto Rico, which, you know, everyone's like, well, that's basically America. And obviously it is. Yeah. But when the panic and set, it didn't feel like America. Like, no, I bet I, not. Yeah. I was like, all right, get me the hell out of here. We were um, at uh, like a bar because it was like one of the only things open. The stores have already closed. It was right across from our hotel. And, uh, it seemed like, and I talked to some locals right after, we saw some motorcycles when we were down there. It was nice. It was like 70, 80, but. Uh, we didn't see many motorcycles down there. And then mm. the last meal we had, there's like just groups of like 50 to 100 motorcycles at once just tearing up and down the streets. And right before that meal, we actually went, even though we knew we weren't staying, we went mm. to grab like 50 to $100 in like groceries because we didn't know if we were going to get out. And we were in a hotel room with no kitchen, no groceries, all this stuff. So we're at the grocery store, stuff's starting to shut down. And like across the street, there's like police barricading certain streets and you know, as an you know, American that doesn't spend a ton of time in Puerto Rico, I'm like, maybe they do this every Sunday. Maybe it's, you know, I didn't feel that weird. Right. And uh, I talked to some locals after and they started barricading streets and they were moving like uh, naval boats in the position to lock down the island, I guess, because they didn't know what the national, Jeez. national government was going to ask them to do. Yeah. And that got out and these motorcycle gangs, like all of them, decided that they were going to like revolt against the police and unbarricade the island and here are six you know because we're on vacation too so six semi-tipsy americans getting ready to fly out eating a cheeseburger and drinking tequila and there's just like hundreds of motorcycles going up and down the street and i'm looking around at our table i'm like do you guys remember this many motorcycles being out and like everyone's like no and then we get on the plane and it, it, we heard that story where like mm. it was basically like it's the civilians trying to keep the government from like making everyone stay in certain blocks in the island. And we had no clue. We're just yeah. getting dumb, fat and happy in a restaurant. And, uh, you know, three, four hours later, I found out, I was like, wow, you know, and then yeah. 12 hours later, cause we all had to switch our flights. So like people were just flying wherever, just get, you know, get me back to, <laughs> to the, the, to the, you know, the continental and, uh, and then driving and taking cars. And it was, a, it was a heck of a trip back. I think maybe, when I look back on that, I'll remember that like, wow, I don't, I'm not sure I really knew what was going on, but I'm yeah, you, you barely made it. Yeah. yeah. I was following the Facebook saga of that deal. And I was like, holy crap, these dudes are going to get stuck down there. Yeah. I'm not, yeah I'm, it was damn near close, right? Yeah. I mean, very close. I'm you know, very, very close. And like I said, I think we were closer than people thought because they were prepping, you know, if you have an Island and the national government asks you to do something, it's going to be very hard to like, actually contain an island and boats and all this stuff so they were prepping to lock stuff down before they were even asked to mm -hmm. which spooked everyone down there i mean i again right. it was happening but a lot of the locals did so um yeah it was, it was pretty crazy i don't know i'd either probably be dead from starvation because we had no food or, and everything would have been closed or i'd be super tan and <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> i'm not sure what would have happened but. yeah man so far my life hasn't changed much. I stay at home anyways, but, um, 
for, for the, I mean, the last numbers I saw 3.2 million people out of jobs. Un, yeah. Unreal. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah. Sorry. What were we going to say? Well, they just said that it might get as high as 35%. I don't think it's going to go that high, but um, I, I think that's, what's kind of cool. Cause um, you know, I talk to my family, I have different stresses. I, I can't get fired, but I have employees, right? So yeah. I feel responsible of, you know, leading a revenue and finding at least something short term to make sure that you're not, you're not laying people off and you're not, not paying back private investors. So it's just a different stress. I, I, like I, like you said, my life hasn't changed a lot. I've uh, been blessed enough to have some reserves for myself and the company put away. But like you said, I thought I had real reserves, uh, especially comparing to like other people in my local industry, economy, competition, if you want to call it that. And then, you know, you have, you got real bills and, and real payroll. Like yesterday I paid out uh, some big projects as far as contractors and stuff like that logged into my bank account. And then tomorrow I pay all my mortgages and all of a sudden you're looking at what you considered like high reserves and you're looking at, you start doing the mental math, like how long can we do this? So mm -hmm. I think it's very important that people go back to, I mean, I know a lot of people are working, but just going back and making money, um, in any legal way that they have in the past, you know? So like we're, right. we're not really wholesalers anymore, but we're going to be doing some wholesaling and some short-term cash grabs right now, just to make sure that I'm not laying people off or getting myself in a bad spot. So right. it's very important. I think it's important to lead with revenue and not, you know, sit around and just wait for stuff to continue to either get worse or better, you know, yeah. do some stuff that, that maybe you were really good in the past and uh, revisit some stuff that, you know, just, just gives you, you know, two to three months to, to let the dust settle. I think that's our plan. I don't want to act like I'm that smart to figure out, you know, what I should or shouldn't be doing three months out. So we're just going to try to help people with the wholesaling side, either joint venture or get really good opportunities to our investors. That way we don't, you know, we don't, you know, I think doing good business right now, making sure you pay all your bills and continue to be active and trying to help people. People are going to remember who asked for, private lender, you know, two, three month breaks. I think if you can do good business and continue to make a couple bucks, I don't think it's going to be, you're going to make the same. You see some of these gurus and, and people that I even look up to, but they're like, yeah, nothing's changed for me. I'm still out there. Okay. But when it's a trickle down, right? The, the, the money's coming out of the economy. You're going to feel it no matter what. And some of these guys maybe do have seven, eight, nine digits in liquidity and reserves. So like mm -hmm. that changed or long term. The short term, they're not going to be pulling in revenue. So um, I do think it's very important to to worry about the short term. It's like a it's like this marathon, right? Like you're trying to get to the finish line, but if you don't run the first mile, you can't get the mile 26. So just be aware of cash flow is king right now and, and, and make sure you're making some short term money and some low risk moves and, and not and not not being too proud to pivot. You know, you'll see some guys that were dominant in some sectors like Airbnb. Right. And if you're proud to pivot right now, you could get crushed for like three, four months. That really starts to add up. Maybe, maybe not day 15, it hurts, but like day 45 or whatever that looks like, it could really hurt. So I just think everyone needs to be aware of what's working and what's not working and, and, and play short term, which you'll never, ever hear me say, right? right. Like, you'll always be thinking long term. But in something like this, I don't think, you know, normal business rules don't apply, so. Hopefully everyone's out there just staying educated and staying active too for their mental sanity at the very least because sitting in the house gets pretty, it <laughs> gets pretty rough. So, right. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, I've got two kids out here running a muck in the house. So, um, it stays pretty active around here, but they've been handling great. Actually, it's been, it's been really cool. Um, I'm curious to see, cause you started kind of a little bit backwards than I hear most investors, you started out flipping. And then you went into wholesaling and then you went into uh, long-term holds and multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think I understand why you started flipping first because you have family members doing it and you saw the bigger paychecks and that's why you got into that and you kind of had a little bit of the know-how, but what made you go from flipping to wholesaling then back to that type of a model? And, uh, uh, and then I was going to ask you another question, but I'll wait for you to answer that one. Yeah, actually, that's that's a great question because I think a lot of people, 
Well, let's hit with the, the first thing. I just knew it existed. So like yeah. it, right in the heyday of like HGTV, like glorifying flippers. And there was like, everyone had a flipping show. And, um, you know, it was really cool to watch people make something super ugly, very beautiful, make 50, 60, a hundred grand, you know, cause those TV numbers make it seem like. Right. Money and yeah. But, um, so I knew it existed. I didn't even know wholesaling existed. I, I remember the day, uh, one of my buddies, Nick Phipps is a, at the time, probably the biggest wholesaler in Cleveland. And then I, I got to believe I was up there when we were doing our wholesaling is probably the second biggest when I started to learn the industry, but he was, I was trying to help him flip a house cause he wasn't a house flipper and he just reached out to me. Hey, can you come pick some um, finishes for this house? We didn't really know each other. It was more like an online uh, thing. He just saw what I was doing and vice versa. And um, so I had seen all this stuff on HGTV where you had read, you know, really easy access to see that this existed. All right. These are some of the profit margins that could exist if I decided to go down that path. And, um, so I did, and then it was just trying to help a, you know, a buddy of a buddy in the industry get a flip right and, uh, told him I would do X, Y, and Z. And, uh, he was in the front yard, obviously very excited because, you know, everyone starts doing that math. All right. If that costs 12 grand and I owe this or whatever, I don't even know if I can silence that, but he started doing the math and getting all excited. And I was thinking, well, this is a nice house and I'm, I'm starting to do what I would have made on that house. All right. You buy in this area for whatever 50, you put 10 grand into it, you make 20 grand. That's usually the model in that little pocket of Cleveland. And mm -hmm. uh, he was like really, really happy in the front yard when I started telling him what I think it would sell for if he put, you know, whatever tile there and some granite there. And uh, you know, I, obviously I eventually had to ask, well, how much are you, how much are you going to make on this house? And he's like, uh, well, if it sells for what you said I'd sell for, you know, I think he was making on, and it was a, a super quick turn. He turned the house in like two weeks and the house was only worth like 80 grand and he was going to make like 40 or 50. Cause he had, Jeez. yeah, yeah. Right. Like in margins. Um, and I was flipping in areas where it's like you bought for a hundred, put 50 into it and you would make 40 or 50 back then. Mm -hmm. And it would be, a three month process. So, uh, he started telling me how much he was going to make. And he, I go, how do you know, how'd you buy this house so cheap? Where, how much did you pay for this house? And these are houses I would have bought for, you know, 45, 50 grand on the market. He paid 12 grand. So now the next, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> now the next question is how, and he, yeah. pops, he pops his trunk and takes out one of those little, uh, yellow letter postcards. And he tells me about wholesaling. So like, that almost had to be like brought to my doorstep where like flipping was this glorified thing that the, there was internet articles about readily available. There was TV shows about it. You turn on like huge uh, network TV and they would be telling you how to buy a property at auction and then fix it up and sell it. Right. It took me basically running face first in the wholesaling um, out of chance to, to know it existed. I know you can go find articles on bigger pockets or, google it or whatever but i just didn't even know it existed until this guy showed me these note cards and then you go down a rabbit hole why would people start telling you these houses for so cheap and, and why is that a win-win and how do you get good at this and we got pretty good at it for a long time and then we gave all our money back to the irs because it's hard to write stuff off when you're wholesaling so then we moved from wholesaling to the burr method just for tax tax reasons you know then we don't have to pay any taxes or very minimal taxes so right that was the progression. I didn't like, very rarely do I have like a five-year plan that actually, I mean, I might have it, but it doesn't, it doesn't work out. Right. Life happens and teaches you different things and you go down this. So that was it. I just found it second. So I was flipping first. Mm -hmm. And then one last thing I would say is that, and I think a lot of people need to be a little more conscious of this. Like I wasn't a good flipper. Like I got no construction background. I got a money background, a finance background. So I had to employ or partner with the right people to, get the flips right uh, or the inspection or sales process or all that stuff would go a lot worse than we anticipated because I wasn't, I have friends that are great flippers because they came through construction, but maybe right. they're sharp on the finance side as I am. And uh, that was another reason I pivoted to wholesaling. Like trading paper was so much easier than pulling permits and getting everything right and making sure the architectural plans were approved and all that. So I did that. And um, what's, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but what's cool about the multifamily spot is there's like when you're doing a four to $5 million building 
or project, you don't have to be good at everything. In fact, you can't be good at everything. The numbers are so big. The expectations are so large. The time commitment can be so big. You know, it's an 18 month project or a 12 month project instead of a two, four, five week project that you really have to like be dialed in on your one thing on that project. So your joint venture partners typically fill roles that you won't. So I don't have to be good at construction. Like very rarely am I handling the construction on the multifamily. I'm just deal finding, deal structuring, bringing the right people in and then trying to walk away from it and find another deal. So it was almost, uh, I didn't know it exists. I found it. So I went into that space and made a couple bucks when I transitioned and also just a natural progression of realizing, okay, if I'm not that great at this construction piece, where do I go where I, the deal's big enough to bring in an awesome joint venture partner that is great at construction. And then uh, I don't have to bang my head against that wall all day trying to figure out how to become good at it. I can just stay in my, you know, little unique ability of deal finding and finding off market property. So um, just, you know, kind of being young and dumb and make enough mistakes where you realize that you don't want to stay in a certain spot that there might be an easier uh, way to make money and we just hopefully transition there. And like I said, hopefully everything goes back to, to normal and that's still our bread and butter. So, All right. Yeah. So is that, is that your main uh, avenue of concentration right now, multifamily or is that just one you kind of eventually grew into? Uh, that's definitely the main concentration. The, Air, the Airbnb stuff is really, really cool. We were buying houses in Cleveland for uh, like, a, we were buying houses for like 50 grand. Mm-hmm. And in Cleveland, sometimes that means pretty good areas, uh, four to five bedroom houses. We got some stuff, you know, a block away from like Starbucks and, and Whole Foods and stuff where you're getting off market houses, four bedrooms for 50 grand. So our, our market's pretty unique and it mm-hmm. allows mistakes because we have such a good market. And, um, you know, we buy those houses for 50, put 50 into them and they're appraising for 200 grand. And then we're pulling a bunch of tax free money out of it. And we're also keeping an Airbnb that's making 125 bucks a night and uh, getting booked up at a pretty decent rate before all this happened. So that is where we went just because it was so hot <clears throat> right. before this virus. But it's very hard to scale. We only have like, you know, 50 of them and a lot of them are joint ventures. So uh, in other areas, my first multifamily building was 48 units. So something that's taken me years and uh, a lot of time to perfect. We've only got the 40 units and, well, I'm sorry, 40, 50 units. And then the first deal I ever did with multifamily was already that big of a portfolio. So that's why the other side multifamily is the focus is just because it's more scalable. You know, like 650 Airbnbs would take forever and be such a headache uh, to do so. So I'm, it's doable and maybe that's somewhere we go and then package them up and sell them off off to a fund or something, a hedge fund, but it's uh, you can get 650 units. You know, you'll see some of these big players in Cleveland and in the multifamily spot, they're, they're pulling down, you know, 650 unit apartment buildings. So it's just, it's just easier to scale and uh, you don't have to worry about a bazillion bills and a bazillion LLCs and all this stuff. It almost can, part my, you know, it's just like one little community that increases your net worth exponentially, it increases your unit count exponentially. So there's definitely an advantage of going into that space because it just allows you to f- kind of focus and grow at a different rate than I think really any other asset class because they're just bigger. So, right. Yeah. No. Um, well, being as you know, Tim, obviously, uh, are you doing a similar model that he, like he does? Cause a lot of guys are in it for, uh, five to seven years and they're out, they're resale. Um, and I know people that have made some serious money with that, but Tim's model is syndicate, remodel, refinance, get his investors out and keep it long term for himself. Is that something that you're kind of doing as well? Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I've learned a ton from him. Not only is he like one of my best friends, but we own, you know, over a hundred units together and stuff like that. He helped me purchase my first one, the 40 mm-hmm. units that I was talking about. He teaches at a really high level too. So if you ever get yeah. to see him on stage, it's really, really, really good. And that model works. Also, it's different. You know, there's so many people like syndicating out there the traditional way that if Tim's pitching to the same investor 
that we'll call like eight, eight to nine other traditional syndicators are pitching to. Like he's probably one of the only ones that has like a different uh, interest breakdown, different tax benefits. Okay, now you've got some ownership. Now you've got like depreciation and all this other stuff that he's offering that a lot of people aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, even after their money's paid back entirely. So it, it's been great to learn that way. We do have a lot of the same model. And I think, especially if this, because we were at the peak of a market, uh, it really was the only way to buy, you know, like I saw something, I actually screenshotted it right before we came over um, and started, you know, chatting before we went live. But there's something that just traded in Orlando uh, that like a, it was like a sub four cap and a cash transaction. It was just crazy, right? So That's nuts, yeah. Insane. Cash transaction, sub four cap. And what, what that makes me think is like, yeah, I mean, no one wants to be in this like little pocket of this virus or we'll call it like almost like sub economy right now. Mm. It's not putting anyone in a good spot, but I'll tell you what, having the model that Tim had or I had the last couple months or years leading up to what is at least at the very least a short term recession makes me feel a little better that we were buying at 10 and 12 caps and, you know, putting in the sweat equity than just going and raising a ton of money and buying at five, six, seven caps and now yeah. have this dip right because there's nowhere to go when you pay that much 120 a unit blah 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 four cap sort of assets right right now they got to be at least panicking and uh, yeah. not, that, not that we're not but when you're buying it instead of 120 a unit in cash we're buying it 25 a door or 32 a door depending on the asset class even if the market tanks a little bit, you're hoping that it hits you a little different than those people that are out there just paying top dollars. So I think buying off market and value adding at the top of a market makes a lot of sense. Now, granted, if we were to really go through a recession, um, you don't have to value add. In fact, it's probably not worth your time to value add. I was listening to a podcast that, you know, I don't even know who was, it was Josh Cantwell's podcast, but I, I do forget who like the, you know, the guest was, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but he, he was talking about the model of, just raising money. He was raising 20, 30, 40 million bucks at the bottom of the last recession. He was a Cali kid and had access to a lot of money or, you know, he, he knew people that had access to a lot of money. Right. And um, when he went and actually got that fund up with like 25 or $35 million, everyone was telling him just buy everything at the bottom of this market. Don't worry about the construction phase or value add or anything because the, the big indicator or the, next two to three years is just how fast the economy is going to go up and how much you can buy at 30 cents on the dollar. So we were always worried about buying and then value adding and refining because it was the only way to stay active at the top of the market because like we just talked about buying at a four cap or a five cap or a six cap doesn't make any sense. And that's what stuff was trading at still, still is apparently right. from that email I just saw. And that in the other market, there was a kid that just had access to capital and all these people that had gone through recessions or even market dips before him said, buy everything. Don't worry about stabilizing it and putting renters in it. Just deploy that money, put some money in your, you know, your own account and or your business account to allow this market to kind of turn and you can pay the interest and the investors and all that stuff. So you got a little reserves. All right. He said he didn't listen. He said he, he was buying stuff at the bottom of the market, but he wasn't deploying, you know, 32 of the 35 million and just letting it sit and increase in appreciation. He said he was deploying, you know, one, two, three million dollars because he felt like that was safe, stabilizing it, trying to get the tenants in, and then refi and all this stuff. And it was just the wrong, it was the wrong play in that market. He said if he would have deployed, you know, 32 of the 35 million dollars, put three, three million in reserves to basically see this portfolio out for the next two to three years and paying the investors and paying the property taxes and stuff like that. You know, three years later, he was in Memphis. He was deploying the capital in Memphis, but living in Cali. He said that, that, that 32 million or 30 million would have been worth 60, even though all the houses were still vacant and there was no tenants in it. So in the market we were just in, that is the, I think the only way to continue to buy uh, apartment buildings, but you gotta be uh, aware of, not only just the stock market and the general world's economy, but you know, what, what sub market are in, are, are you in uh, what, is it a boom or bust type of city? Is it a boom or bust type of uh, real estate, you know, 
his, you know, if, his, if history in that area is a boom or bust, then you have to change your model too, because you don't want to be get, you know, caught holding this this huge bag at the top or bottom of the recession. So I think that that was that was the model we were using, and it made a lot of sense. But if if things change, you know, I'd obviously be <laughs> very willing to look at new models or models that didn't make sense last year or whatever that looks like. Because I've seen I do a lot of reading and listening to people. And there's a hundred different ways to make money in real estate. You just got to be kind of aware of what, what the market's doing. Right. Yeah. Every time you said four or five, six cap, I was thinking Grant Cardone, cause he just laid off 80 people out of his 180 people staff or person staff, because he was one of those syndicators buying at the super low caps and that uh, a class properties that aren't going to be held, holding up right now. So the problem with, and first off, I, I've listened to a lot of Grant's podcasts and stuff like that uh, about real estate. And like I said, I'm a little bit of a money guy and not construction guy either, but he's really a money guy and a market mm -hmm. guy and not a real estate guy. And I don't mean that disrespectfully because I think he honest to God is one of the best marketers and money raisers that we have. Yeah. So I don't want him to be good at construction. I already talked about that. I'd rather have him be great at that and then employ good people that are good at construction. But if you listen to his podcast, he's not like, you can tell he's not like super, on the day to day or even have a huge understanding of it, mm -hmm. which he probably doesn't want to be right. So, but that model for him, what scares me is that he got, he gets paid to buy, manage and sell. Yeah. So if you're putting your money in that fund, it doesn't matter what happens. Grant gets paid the whole way. Right. So that's maybe why sometimes those purchases at six caps, and super high end class A stuff where he's raising money right around there too. I know Grant raises money cheap, but there can't be that big of a spread of where he's raising in a six cap. It just can't make sense. Right. So I don't know if he's super worried about the fund making a ton of money. I think he's worried about making money in all three buying, managing and selling. So even if this goes really bad and Grant has to liquidate, there's some stuff in his fund where he's getting paid the whole way out. And, uh, that's why I posted some article the other day that I thought it was weird that he laid a bunch of people off and, you know, everyone knows how much that guy spends personally and in business. So uh, not saying in his, he's in a bad financial position, mm -hmm. but I am saying I wouldn't want my liquidity in his fund, if that makes sense. Right. Because everyone's like, oh, Grant's going broke. And I'm like, if you really read some of the stuff, like you can, you can go get his package of what you can read before you invest. In his, right. And it, I know people that have read it all. I've, you know, had lawyers give me, you know, like little cliff notes on it and stuff. Like he's getting paid the whole way out. So I don't think it's possible really for Grant to go broke in this, at least for a while. Um, but I don't think it's good for his investors the way he set up the fund. So we'll see. I mean, maybe he's a lot smarter than me <laughs> and he's got all this liquidity and I'll be wrong, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, speaking of investors, um, as you grew, um, so from flipping to wholesaling, when you're wholesaling, you didn't really need private investors. Then you went back into flipping and holding and you've got, um, it sounds like quite a few single families. Has it always been bank or private money for those long-term holds or? You know, it's crazy. It's like everyone, and obviously I know this is true because everyone talks about it. Um, they say you can get up to like 10 traditional bank loans. I never had one. I came out and raised some private money and then refied it out through, well, I, I can, we consider them, I don't know what they're even called technically, but like they're not traditional banks. Like it's not PNC or, you know, first federal Lakewood or, uh, you know, Huntington or anything like that, that quick and loans, stuff like that, where they're really traditionally writing mortgages, mm -hmm. but we get private money, hard money, stabilize an asset. And then we would go to, the same person that got us the hard money and they were able to put us in touch with a lot of like life insurance companies and or other companies that have obviously massive reserves because not everyone's dying on the same day or, you know, other kind of insurance companies where like not everyone's crashing their car on the same day. So they have mm -hmm. these reserves and they have to invest them. And we were always able to take our money on those single family houses out uh, 30 year fixed. And a lot of times anywhere between depending on the asset type or, loan size we were taking the money back out at five to seven percent yeah which can be high but it was such an easy button and the loans were usually traditionally smaller because we're buying off pro market properties and um you know much under the appraised value that was coming in for the 
you know, ARV and stuff like that. So right. we would just, I've never had a traditional bank loan in my life. So really just hit the ground with the, the private and hard money. And uh, a lot of that came from going to the right events, masterminds and getting around people that already had those connections. So yeah, right. you know, zero traditional money. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. That's, uh, well, that's, that's same for me, kind of. Uh, my long-term uh, rentals are in private or owner finance right now. I've never gone to the bank yet. Um, but I just assumed that that's kind of like the avenue most people went was was the bank money on the refi on the burn models and, and especially the apartments. But, you know, and one of my thoughts was like, and maybe it's short-sighted because I know those, those, especially when I could have gone and got my first 10 one, you know, 10 loans. I think that the interest would have been crazy on those. It would have been like three ish, 4%. So I would have saved some money over 30 years and it would definitely have mattered. But I, I like to consider myself like a bigger thinker. And I always had this vision of hundreds of units. So mm -hmm. getting 10 bank loans and then eventually having to get used to this process, you know, loan 11 to infinity. All right. In my head, I was like, you know, screw it. <laughs> I'm going to go in that little sector. Right. I'm super used to banging these out and hopefully scaling faster and easier. And it's definitely easier. Um, you know, even with those, or I would call them like semi-traditional banks, uh, depending on who's lending a credit union or a life insurance company, there's always like these levels of ease, right. To capital and mm -hmm. ease capital to us was huge. I mean, our private lenders have been all over the place where it's like, um, they're checking your comps. They want X amount of comps. It's got to be super strict as far as how close they are to the, the, the project you're doing. They want pictures, they want walkthroughs. And now our, our, our private lender now is like incredibly easy to deal with. And he wires us half the renovation up front. So we're not floating any of the renovation, which becomes very big when you're scaling because a lot of those hard money lenders, they want you to, you know, put up 33% of the money and they pay right. it. That worked. Yep. If you got some cash and or you're doing one to five houses at a time, but if you're scaling that to hundreds and tens of houses and you're putting up 33% on every house, it gets very expensive, almost impossible to move forward and scale. So the ease button now is he gives us, he wires me half and then he wires my lawyer half, <laughs> not his lawyer, not the title company, my lawyer. Right. And when I need the other half, I text my lawyer, email my lawyer. Obviously I got to show some stuff, but that that's been a huge advantage for me moving in the last year and a half is that I've been quicker um, and I've been able to do more projects than a lot of people that I, you know, compete with. And uh, it's just because the money was easier. Right. So I get a lot of students in my consulting business and stuff that like constantly are trying to raise cheaper money, uh, which I know is important, but I, I truly believe that if I'm able to move faster and better that like I'll lock up properties at such a, different discount that like private money doesn't matter. I pay a lot of 12% and I know a lot of people in this market are like, dude, you're a big player in the market. How are you still paying 12%? I'm like my 12% is like a phone call or a text. Right. So wiring when you're out there trying to get your 10% down to nine, you know, and I've already locked up the house and closed on it. So it's just a different philosophy up here for me is I know a lot of people focus on if you can get cheaper mark, you know, I'm more worried about the 30 year fixed money and what that interest rate is than what I'm paying for two months, three months. Some of these things are out of the, you know, we, we renovated and refied in two to three months. So like, I don't, what's the difference in 9% and 12% over three months? No. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been kind of my, my mindset is it, 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 like you were saying, a lot of experienced people are like, ah, oh, 12% is nuts. But even especially new people, it's like, I'm not paying 12%. That's unheard of. That's like damn near usury. And I'm like, do you want the house or not? I mean, shit, you're going to have it three, if you, even if you suck at it, you're gonna have a six months. I mean, what is that? It's, it's nothing. So I, I've never understood that. No. And, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't come from a trust fund. Right. So like, if you're really going to go try to buy 10 houses and I, <laughs> that's another way I got into wholesaling that we should have talked about. I bought way too much shit. <laughs> it mm -hmm. was bad at it. So I was, yeah. I was holding them six months or sometimes four months before they started demoing. Right. Cause I just didn't have the construction or any of the systems in place. Yeah. And, uh, at that time, I moved wholesaling, but I had all these like crazy good flip opportunities that very quickly became wholesale opportunities just because I was young and stupid. Mm -hmm. No one to actually flip these houses that I had plans of flipping, you know, as far as good crews and 
um, funds to do it. So I just literally had to piece, you know, piece them off and we ended up making some coin in the process. But it's, uh, if you want to go buy, you know, and I think at that time I would have been like 26, you know, if you're, if you're not coming from a rich family or anything like that and you want to buy 10, 20 doors when you're 26 mm -hmm. years old, like, you know, I probably would have paid 22%. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if I had to, so. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people out there doing uh, equity partnerships, you know, either 50-50 to start up or 25% of the the end net proceeds or whatever. Um, yeah, same, same thing as you. I mean, why not just pay what you got to pay to get in the game and stay in the game? I mean, it doesn't yeah, make any I sense. Do, I do see a lot, of, and there's people in our market that do that, where they, you know, they go get 0% money and or reduce – uh, interest payments or back, you know, you get those people that backload their interest payments. I don't mm -hmm. like people like that. It keeps me super dishonest. Like I have no want to finish a project when I can't see the money coming out of my account, you know? So if I can see myself paying someone monthly, not only do I know where my true cash reserves and profit lines are, but I can see the money coming out. And then I look at the whiteboard and it's like, all right, which one of these can cash flow the soonest or which one can refi the soonest? And you'll see a lot of those guys that have 50-50 splits or backloaded interest. They hold a lot more inventory because they're, they're not getting 100% of the profit or they're not feeling the cash flow squeeze. So I've just never been a believer in that. I, I think some some people that really will get hurt, in some, you know, either in the 08 turn or, or the turn that we're kind of going through with this virus is like people that were able to hold a bunch of inventory, non-producing inventory because they structured loans where it didn't make them operate in a great way you know, the bleed wasn't there, like the, the urgency wasn't there. So hopefully I'm wrong and everyone comes out of this all honky dory. But I, I like, I like the first of the month kind of like shocking my checking and business checking account. And it puts a little fire under my ass to go maybe wholesale something or lock up some new consulting clients or whatever. I think it just keeps you honest, like owning the project, mm -hmm. and spending someone else's money or owning the project and seeing like a believe or not because not, you don't get every project right some of them do sit for six months or like the city puts it uh you know some sort of you know they stop the project when you get the plans right or the drawings right or whatever that looks like permits right um and you some of them don't go as planned but when you're actually kicking your own money out and mm -hmm. watching your cash flow and or profit margin shrink i mean that there's no motivation to get that project back on board like that Right, an owner and paying your own bills. So, I got a lot of people that are constantly focused on, like you said, maybe giving away a piece of the deal so it's easier or cheaper. But sometimes when it's easier, you don't take it as serious, right? Because right. Like, you're only on the hook for fifty percent, or you don't have any payments. So, like you know, that project sits empty for three weeks before it gets demoed because it's not your baby. So I don't know. It's just different, you know, different strokes for different folks. But I always like being in control and, and really feeling the the urgency of getting something done and making money on it. So. Right. No, that's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, that's kind of like, uh, my evolution of deals is, is, uh, started out hard money. Um, so 1% a month is, yeah, it's all right. But once month four or five, six starts rolling, you're like, Oh, it's got expensive real quick. And, uh, then you, you learn from your mistakes and then, um, then the private money comes and, uh, it's a game changer. It allows, uh, significant growth, but, I do have quite a few of the lenders that uh, because they're an IRAs or some other tax uh, free entity or, or uh, account uh, that the interest does come on the back end. There's been a couple of times where I'm going to the closing table and I see that HUD, I'm like, holy balls, that is a lot of interest. Yep. I mean, and, and I've got friends, obviously not trying to, <laughs> put, you know, put anyone on blast out there, but like, it's so easy to just to hold inventory and, uh, you know, it, Cleveland's not a huge, huge market. So, like, mm -hmm. you sometimes know who owns what or, you know, just by the architectural, like, design and or the scale of the project and the suburb it's in, I can almost guess who owns it, right? Right. I buy the same house for, like, a, sometimes, like, a year and a half. Now, granted, these are, like, super high-end flips where their profit margin is 3x what I would have made anyways because I just don't like doing that high-end flip. It's just not who I am. Right. I'm driving by some of those houses that I can either one, I know cause I've had a conversation with them cause it's not a huge market or two, I can guess again, just because it's kind of their niche. Okay. That's probably so-and-so. And then you're driving by it for a year and a half is like the, the project goes on. And I, 
again, know how their loans were set up. And I'm thinking yeah. the same thing. How much is going to be left when they send that, sell it right. out? They have 14 or 15 interest payments baked into the HUD. But um, that's, that's why I like just to kind of put my feet to the fire and pay it every month. Right. Uh, I don't know if I have to go raise money. I know if I have to go make short term money. You know, I always still tell people like uh, when they ask what, you know, what's your bread and butter, you should have an answer. But like businesses are like plants, right? Like, sometimes they're overwatered, sometimes mm -hmm. underwatered, sometimes they need sunlight. So sometimes your bread and butter doesn't matter. Like your, right. your plant needs water, right? And now all of a sudden, all that matters is getting your plant water. So I know focus, the most successful people I know in business are focused, but a lot of times that focus comes with good reserves. Uh, we'll call it like savviness in the market, probably because they've been around long enough to build up those reserves. So like sometimes when you're young or you're scaling a business, the focus can't be there. It's got to be like, what does the plant need today? And you got to go make that work. And then, you know, you'll be able to get laser focus down the road when you have, you know, real systems in place and real reserves and, and really a, a class team members on your, on your, on your company's, you know, team and or board, uh, making sure that everything gets easier. But I always tell people like early on, it's all about getting to the next logical step, right? Like you can't be always worried about a five-year plan. Right. No, that's great. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying, a lot of people were saying, uh, you know, find your niche and just go for it. But sometimes, you know, for the first year or two, it's just survival. What's you know, like, what's your plan need? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's probably what it has to be because you get those statistics nationwide of how many small businesses, businesses and investors will go out of, out of business in those, you know, that one year span, the two year, five year plan, they're staggering. And I yeah. think what they do is they get married to this passion and, yeah. uh, I got family members and friends that start businesses and I was like, dude, have a passion because I have one. It's not really real estate. I like to raise money for like other organizations and, and try to donate money back. And, but that's, I'm not doing that every day and, or it's not my focus because then red door and bulletproof go out of sale or uh, out of business. And I never get that passion thing. Maybe that's like my, my focus daily when I'm, 35 or 45 or, or I've made enough money in real estate where I can just hire someone to deal with the real estate side and I can move, but your passion needs to come after profits. And I know that's right. not always popular, but I don't give a shit because everyone that puts that passion before profits is never going to get to make a real big impact on their, uh, their passion because sometimes it just doesn't come. So I'd be very careful about having your passion before profits, I think your passion should co you know, coexist with the profits. You know, if you get enough of it, you can go take some time to do give back and make a difference in the world. But if you're, if you can't, if you're firing people to chase your passion, it just seems almost uh, bittersweet, right? Like you got to yeah. leave profits and then, and then find a way to make your passion incorporated in that. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. I mean, last year I went to, uh, Peru, Nigeria, and uh, I saw some. Um, I know a friend you may know him too. Will Crozier goes to the Philippines. He bought an orphanage out there. So I, I've been to a lot of orphanages in other countries, and it's kind of like where uh, I feel my my life's mission is. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I gotta make some freaking money. You know, I gotta be able to go over there stress free, not worry about bills being unpaid before I can really put my heart heart and soul into this. And um, and then some people are like, well, just go drop it all. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not going to go there and stress out. Well, the problem with that is, is like, um, you know, so first off, I saw those pictures. I was clicking through some stuff right before we got on. Like you said, you know, we know a lot of the same people and I follow your stuff on Facebook, but it's always good to try to <laughs> know a little more, especially mm -hmm. if you're talking to someone for a little bit. But yeah. you know, I know Mark Evans has done some of that. And other people where they're building schools or, or houses and stuff over there. That's awesome, right? Like yeah. that's way really cooler. Than turning a house in Cleveland. I think right. if you have heart, you're always going to be passionate about giving like houses and schools to people that have none, more so than just making one kind of nicer in your own neighborhood. So like, of course, I'd rather drop it all and go build schools, right? But yeah. like my mom's been sick and I've been able to help her with that. I, you know, I was living in what people would consider like, you know, in my early 20s, like relatively poor surroundings and now I'm not you know so like I've helped myself I've helped my family that's like my first brick like the first foundation right now now but like as soon as you like you can go mentally clear up here and you have enough passive and you have enough clarity and 
like I said, you don't need a bazillion dollars to live in Cleveland, Ohio. Like, yeah, of course I'd rather go give away houses or schools or help those guys that have that footprint already in Africa. Correct. Right. South America, go do that kind of stuff. But I do think it's very important because it, it is a bit of a cold world out there. And I think uh, guys with big hearts and the ability to help other people should, but at the end of the day, something like this happens with a virus or whatever. It's very rare that someone's going to come help you, you know, you out of that hole. So you right. got to pour from like a full cup and make sure that you and your family are right and then give as much back as possible, you know? Yeah. There's a guy here in Dallas, um, uh, Matt Monero. Have you heard of him? Big uh, I, uh, billionaire trucker. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he wrote a book called You Need More Money. That's yeah. freaking, freaking great. I mean, it, the book's not even about money necessarily. It's about all the things that it gives you to, um, I guess you call it power to do, you know, live your life, protect yourself, your family, uh, and then ultimately help uh, the rest of the world. But uh, as a book like that got a lot of backlash. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know if there's anything truer to it. And, and, and you get that, you know, it's so weird what people teach you when you're young. It's like money through to all evil, uh, save for a rainy day, all these things that just drilled in you, like from the age of like five to 20, right? When mm-hmm. kind of becoming from a child to an adult, and then you start spending your own money. And a lot of people don't understand, you know, if you're always reacting to the next bill or expense, it's so hard to, ha- it's so hard to give, right? Because human nature is to not be hungry or not, not have a roof over your head. And, uh, you know, I, I've given away a couple bucks, not anything I, I'd be wanting to brag about on a podcast of people that I know are in a much shittier situation than I am in this little virus mm-hmm. for groceries, couple whatever. And if I needed groceries, there's no way I'd do that. I don't care how good of a person I am. You know, it's like, it's just animal instinct to help yourself first. And, uh, if you have enough money and you at least have a couple days or months or years to figure this stuff out. And you don't feel like, you know, there's a gun to your head to eat, then you're going to be able to help a lot more people. I think, like I said, kind of right off the rip is like, you know, the lack of money is the root of all evil. You'll see people start looting and do all yeah. this stuff. So if, yeah, that you need more money and I've had someone else and I bet he's read the book and I've never heard of the book until he said that, but I've had someone say that to me mm-hmm. kind of in the same context. And I remember thinking it's a great point. Like, um, and, and there's some people and it's probably again, you know, all these <laughs> all these little scripts or stereotypes kind of come from really good books or podcasts or whatever, but you'll hear um, Bratz or Evan say money doesn't, it, money doesn't change anyone. It exposes them. Right. Right. Like, the person was a good person when they had a hundred dollars in the account, give them 10 million. Watch how quickly they help people with that 10 million. Right. I was a dick <laughs> with a hundred dollars in his account. Yeah. Give him 10 million. Watch how quickly he pisses everyone off. So I think it's uh it's a real thing and if you just got to make sure that you realize that it's temporary. It's just your turn with it. And if you can help people with cash, that's a, that's a really powerful and, and rare position. There's not a lot of people that get that chance and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be taken lightly. So right. that is what I want to do long-term. And uh, in the meantime, I feel like I need some more money before I can focus on that. So hopefully that's the case and we get right back to a great economy. So, yeah, no, that's, Great point, man. I mean, that's a good place to end this as well as on, on a good note, talking about uh, all the good things we can do in the world. Yeah. Um, mostly because I don't want to take up your whole day. Not that it's like a super, you're stuck at home, but um, I do have to actually run back to Home Depot. So, uh, but I always ask everybody the same question at the end is, is if you had six months to live, what would you do with it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, like I said, I, I, I looked at my reserves. And I do believe I understand some of like the economy at a, at a decently high level from my, from my background and stuff. So I'm looking, mm-hmm. how long do I have to run my company as, as I would if times are good? And, uh, you know, those, it feels like a lot, but it's not. So if I had six months to live, I'd liquidate everything and, you know, make sure I had a living trust in, in place, which I do, but I'd like to tweak it with my lawyer and liquidate a lot of stuff and take that money to, things that actually that actually matter you know because at the end of the day um you know it doesn't matter how big your house is or how many cars you have you can only be in one room you can only drive one car and all that kind of stuff so you mm-hmm. know, the watches and cars and stuff go out the window liquidate some stuff and go try to help as many people as possible it's a corny corny rap lyric but uh 
there's a there's a rap song that says that you die twice basically when they put you in a grave and then the next time is when the last person talks about like a legacy you left so right um, you're just trying to buy as much time because you don't like you said you got six months so you're trying to buy the second life which is oh man do you remember how many houses that guy gave away in south america or whatever that was I think right that, that lasts much longer than six months or 80 years really if you're gonna even if you're blessed you know with a, with a long life cycle so right try to help as many people as you can uh in six months that, that'd be the goal i'm not sure what that would look like maybe uh just because i have the housing background probably go to somewhere that they don't have you know clean and safe house, houses and start building them as cheap as possible and as safe as possible and, and help as many people in whatever country village uh city that looks like you know right seem like a south america type of guy oh yeah like, um... <laughs> six months to live and I'm helping people either way I'd probably rather be warm so right yeah no well, that's awesome man I appreciate your time um I think we covered just about everything we didn't you know not super detailed but man I know I learned a lot from you so uh, I appreciate it yeah um uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of you uh do you have a site for bulletproof that I can send them to so bulletproof is uh got a free site where we post you know videos like this conversations with people in the industry and then we have a paid one it's 139 bucks a month and we don't super hard pitch it because it's just not my personality but one's bulletproof sales you can facebook search that one's bulletproof cartel you can facebook search that and then the best way just to get in touch with me personally is through uh instagram messages or facebook we're pretty responsive on those so if you guys have questions joint venture opportunities, want to get involved, want to just chat, whatever, just hit me up. Uh, the Facebook is Stephen Todd Morris and Instagram is at smorris802. So that's the best way. Cool, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll let you go about your day. Um, it's great talking to you. Thanks, man. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks a lot, dude. See you, man. Later.